Each one of us as a student, anybody who comes to training, is going to go through periods and phases of their training or moments of their training. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. We're back with episode 194. Today, we'll talk to Sensei Richard Hubbard, a thoughtful man who certainly blurs the line between the traditional and the contemporary. At Whistle Kick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners coming in. We've seen a ton of newsletter signups in the last few weeks, and I want to thank everyone for doing that. When we have big stuff going on here at Whistle Kick, or we want some feedback from our listeners, we communicate that over email. If you like the show, and I really hope you do, getting on the newsletter list is an extension of the show. We send out maybe two messages a month. They're generally quite short, and we must be doing something right with them because the unsubscribe rate is very low. I've spoken about martialartscalendar.com a few times on the show. Are you looking for martial arts events in your area? Or maybe you promote events or you just know events that we don't have listed there? If so, please head over there, submit them, check it out, give us some feedback, help us share the site. Our goal is to make this the most comprehensive martial arts event site available. Did I mention it's free to use and to post at, and it always will be? We're just trying to help grow events because they're a great way to connect with new people. We all fantasize about training in multiple martial arts, but few have done it. Even fewer have done it to the degree Sensei Hubbard has. He's a bit of a paradox in the world of martial arts. He's classically trained, but always open to new ideas that might dramatically change what he does. He's a proponent of meditation, but his classes aren't overly formal. These might seem like contradictions, but that's only until you spend some time talking with him, which we're about to do. Sensei Hubbard, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've enjoyed getting to know you a little bit. We've been talking, listeners. I, I had the opportunity to go and hang out with Sensei Hubbard and, and his crew a few weeks ago. Had a blast, and I'm sure... All the good stuff that I saw happening on the mats at the dojo, I'm sure we're, we're going to get a lot of the how that happened, the why that happened that, that turned, you into, turned you into who you are now, and, and I've been looking forward to this one. How did you, as a martial artist, get started, though? Let's start there. Sure. Um, that's a hard question for me to answer because I took a very meandering path through the martial arts. I had um, where where I grew up in uh, central Arizona. When I was a kid, it was there was always a lot of rough and tumble, and there was always a lot of um, just just fighting, you know. And it wasn't serious violence. It was more of what. Rory Miller would call the monkey dance or the educational beatdown, where um, we, were, as young men, were just kind of jockeying for position in our social hierarchies, and occasionally somebody would get out of line, and and you know, so you would you'd have some rough and tumble, or you'd have a little throwdown, and that element of um, violence was always there when I was growing up. Um, so I was very physically aware when I was, when I was growing up, but I also had a, um, a, a, an academic interest in, um, these things. So I grew up watching boxing, um, I grew up watching Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and all of the eighties and the nineties, um, you know, ninja movies and all of that. And my questions had always kind of centered around, where did these arts come from? Why are some of them so very, very different? Why are so many of them doing things that I would never do, um, really? Or we would watch movies and we go, I got a new move. And then you try it on somebody, probably doing it completely wrong. Um, but, uh, and, and it would be refuted, you know, you couldn't make it work. And it would be like, well, why, why would that be? So finally, around eight years old, my parents decided, okay, it's time to enroll him in martial arts and get him some formal training. And the school that I started at uh, was a kind of combination Ed Parker and Tracy Kempo School in Phoenix. And it was there for a couple of years. And even at that age of like eight years old, I felt myself looking at what was being taught, looking at what other people were doing and parsing it. 
kind of picking it apart and being like, well, what is this designed to do as opposed to what is that designed to do? Would this really be workable or usable? Do I like this? Am I ever going to use this or not? Um, so I guess I kind of always had this comparative approach because you would see what happened in the dojo. You would see what happened when you were fighting with your friends. You would see what would happen in a boxing match. You would see what would happen in Bruce Lee movies. You'd see what had happened in Enter the Ninja, you know, and, and all of these things. Um, and then at that point in time, the, uh, my family situation got really bad. And, um, you know, it's not something I really like to talk about a lot, but there was a lot of physical, emotional, domestic abuse. Um, we were, we spent a lot of time in homeless shelters and battered women's shelters and, um, running, hiding. And so that was a very bad time. It was a very dark time in my life. And there was no time for any training. And because we were, um, you know, we were away from friends, we were away from family, we were homeless, we had, um, we, we kind of had nothing. And so I didn't have friends to fight with, I didn't have access to movies, TV, formal training, anything like that. And at that same time, I was also, um, I was trying to resolve trauma. And as a young person, that's uh, it's a really difficult thing because back then there was no PTSD or or acknowledgement of all of the different conditions that are on the the spectrum in terms of the effects that trauma, particularly in childhood during the formative years, can have. And so I had a lot of anger and I had a lot of confusion, a lot of resentment, and a lot of fear because of what was happening in my in my life. But I had no outlet for it. I had no way to train. And so that really, um, it put me in a very bad place. And so then going forward in my life, I worse and worse, um, barely graduated from high school, uh, really got caught up doing a lot of, of very bad things. Um, interestingly enough, I, I wrestled in high school. Um, I trained for Aikido, uh, for in Aikido for about 18 months when I was in high school. And it was the Aikido that really, I think did the most for me at that point in time. I wasn't a very good wrestler, although I really enjoyed it and I understood the practicality of it. Um, and, but Aikido did something really nourishing for me beyond just the physical practice. And, um, so then I went off to university and at university I had no, um, I didn't have the financial means to formally train. There weren't a lot of places near the school. So I ended up connecting with like 10 other guys from various backgrounds and we formed a club on campus and we would all get together and we would just share ideas. So we would alternate. Um, we had Kung Fu practitioners and Taekwondo practitioners, karate, people like me who were, you know, I was a mutt from the Kempo karate wrestling Aikido, you know, world. And one of us would teach a class and then we'd do a lot of sparring. And so we got to really play and experiment a lot. Um, and that was when UFC, the first UFC happened in 93. And that completely changed our world and our perspective on training. And so we started looking out for places that we could find. Um, and there just, there weren't anybody that was doing it at, at a competent level uh, at that point. And uh, I was just too new. And the um, near where I was, there were no uh, real good Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools. And so um, I took a break from training for the next couple of years. I did a little bit of Tang Sudo, um, but because of the tra tra trajectory that my life was taking, there was a, still a lot of violence and still a lot of conflict in my life. And, um, you know, the problem with that was me because I was, I had these unresolved issues um, around the trauma that I had experienced as a child that I didn't even understand how they were affecting my life, but they were making me a pretty miserable person. Um, I went, uh, did my second stint of university at University of Connecticut, and um, I was an uh, acting major. So I was a um, conservatory theater, classical theater person. And during that time, I got to do a lot of stage combat. I got to read a lot of the classic texts on warfare, on personal combat, on history of the Greeks, the Romans, a lot of the Japanese literature. And so I um, 
and and when you're when you're in a conservatory style acting program, you do um, there's an element of you do tai chi and you do internal work for calming and breath control and um, centering. You will do stage combat and martial arts, everything from rapier and dagger to fist fighting, being able to fist fight in uh, you know a Shakespearean piece as opposed to being able to fist fight in uh, you know West West Side Story. Um, you have uh, so th- so I was kind of still involved, even though I wasn't doing a lot of formal training in um, the research, the history, and um, through the the blade work, um, some of the actual functional movement training um, during that whole period of time. And right around 2000, I had an experience that um, it was, it was a near-death experience. And it put me in a state where I realized that the things that I was struggling with that were making my life so miserable and that were getting me into a lot of trouble um, were my fault and they were my choice and they were my doing and that I needed to get a handle on who I was and what was happening or um, or I was, I was going to kill myself. I mean, that really is what it came down to. It was like, I can't do this anymore and I'm going to find a way to resolve this or um, there's no reason for me to be here anymore. And I didn't know what to do because all of the sources that I had um, accessed throughout this point in time in my life in terms of dealing with this unresolved trauma were, you know, oh, go to therapy. Well, I went to therapy and therapy was great because it really helped me understand it in an intellectual kind of abstract level why I was feeling this way, what was going on, you know, that it's not my fault that these are the results of this, but it didn't do anything really to take the pain away. It didn't do anything to really change my behavior. Um, you know, the other answers that I got, go get an education. Okay. Doing that, you know, go get a job. Okay. All right, great. Making good money. Um, but in the process of all that, you realize that you're just covering up the problem and it's just like, well, yes, when you're doing all of these other things, you don't have time to think about it as much, but that doesn't mean that it goes away. And, um, not really knowing where to go or what to do. I, um, I looked up the Zen monasteries on, uh, on, I, I don't even know what the search engine was at that point in time and saw that there was a place in, uh, Mount Trepper, New York in the Catskills. And I had always been, I think my mom gave me uh, Zen flesh, Zen bones, which is the Mumon Connor co- collection of Zen koans when I was in of my freshman year or sophomore year in high school. And, um, that, work really appealed to me in that type of writing. And, um, but I didn't know that there were really any places to practice. And so I said, well, this is worth a shot because I've got nothing to lose. I've got nothing else. And so, um, so I went and, uh, showed up uh, totally unannounced, um, was, was, you know, put through the whole process of, um, you know, coming to, to enter, seeking introduction, had to leave and then come back. Um, and then went into my first period of residency just a few months, um, after that. And that completely, completely altered and changed my world. Um, totally flipped everything on its head because for the first time in my life, I had not just a means for intellectually, abstractly thinking about my own thoughts, but a method, a, a technique, a training methodology, a discipline for putting my ass on the cushion and systematically examining my own mind. And I came out of that with a very different um, experience. It, that was 17 years ago. Um, and I'm still a practitioner. I'm actually heading there this weekend for an intensive meditation retreat. Uh, but when I came out of my first couple periods of residency, I was lost. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to go back to school and further my education. Um, I met my wife. We got married. We moved to New Hampshire. Uh, well, we met in New Hampshire, but we moved to um, kind of where we are now. And I finished uh, my degrees in English and history at, at uh, University of Connecticut and then was planning to go to law school. And right around that time, I got introduced to a um, fellow who had started a mixed martial arts promotion, Global Fight League. And we became involved. I wrote some pieces for him. I became a a managing partner in that company. And so right around that time, um, I had, I had, uh, when I moved to New Hampshire in 2001, um, I started training. 
in a form of Shaolin Kempo. I was promoted to black belt in 2005. And right around 2005 was where I um, met Sensei Lee Rossi of Checkmate Martial Arts and started training with him. And after 11 years of training with him, I was just promoted to, to black belt in his system like a year ago, um, which was fabulous. But um, so I was training with Terry Dow at the training station. I was training with uh, Sensei Lee Rossi. I was training with, um, especially because I was uh, running GFL, I knew all of the MMA guys. I knew a lot of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys. I was training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I was one of the people who would drop in and cross-train at any number of the other, the other gyms in the area. And then in 2007, I met a guy named Tom Kalos. And Tom is uh, Keenan Cornelius' dad. Tom is the guy who introduced uh, BJ Penn to Half Gracie. Old school Ernie Reyes guy uh, was on the West Coast demo team with Scott Coker and a really, really great guy. But he was running a project that he called the Ultimate Black Belt Test. And when I looked at someone with a very diverse training um, background like I, I had, his requirements and his curriculum, his program seemed like a really, really cool thing. So I decided to do that in 2007. And I said, I'm going to take a year, two years of, of my life, this like 2007 to 2009, 2010. And I'm going to completely dedicate myself to full-time training and teaching and promoting the martial arts. So I was, um, I was in the gym 20 hours a week. I was promoting and working um, with Global Fight League and uh, clothing grant brand PBL. And while I was doing that, I was also traveling all around the country. So to the um, expos in Vegas, to Tony Blauer and his uh, PDR certification out in San Diego. Um, Jim Wagner went through his uh, both of his 40-hour level one and level two certifications. Uh, Damian Ross with the um, self-defense company and his combative system went through the uh, 40-hour law enforcement instructor training verbal judo program with um, uh, George Thompson and uh, went through a lot of these different programs, just trying to expose myself to everything that I could that was out there in the in the martial arts. And then, after in 2011, I formed Prevail Defensive Tactics, which is our civilian self defense system. And then uh, we opened up the Prevail Training Center, and we're just going on six years that we've been open. And um, so that's basically my my path through the martial arts. So I've been training, teaching full time for the last 12, 13 years or so. And, um, been practicing Zen for formally as a members, member of that order for 17 years and have accumulated, uh, you know, just over 30 years of training in the martial arts. Wow. There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a, there's a <laughs> lot of points we could spider off from there's one I want to roll back to because there's there's a point in time that I think was probably pretty significant but we didn't we didn't talk about it we, there there was a gap the the month couple months between when you first showed up at the Zen monastery unannounced and when you began your residency there yes because <laughs> you talked about your mindset when you arrived you know that you were it, it you didn't phrase it this way, but I got the sense that it was, this was the last shot. It was this or nothing. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so b before, before you go off, I just, I want to finish this sure. question and then you can, you can answer however you choose. You, you got there and something in what they exposed you to or, or what they said was going to happen when you came back you were you were willing to press the pause button and go do whatever and then come back what was it like in between those points in time the point when you first arrived and they kind of sent you away and the point where you you went there to stay for a while yeah that's that's a great question so they have a a, a formal process that you have to go through if you want to come into residency. You can't just walk in off the street and say, hey, I want to come live here. Um, otherwise, you'd have a lot of crazy people running around. And it's it's a spiritual practice center. It's a monastery. They can't just take in every person off the street. 
And so they, um, so I showed up there. Um, they allowed me to sit with them. It was a Sunday morning. And so I went through the Sunday morning service. I went through the sitting and they were headed into a session. And one of the seniors there said, you know, you might be able to stay, but we're headed into a session and you just have no frame of reference for understanding what that is. You have no, um, no formal basis in this training. And so you can't stay for that. They, in only taking people by application said, look, um, leave and contact us and set up an appointment. And when you set up your appointment, you can come and do whenever you, and you can come whenever you want, but you have to go through that process and do the interview and set up the appointment. So I said, okay. So I, I did their Sunday service and the, the Sunday service was one of the most powerful things that I had ever um, been to. The moment that I heard Daito Roshi speak, I was like, this is what I've needed. This is what I've, I've been looking for for a very, very long time. Um, so after that, I went, uh, one of the, one of the girls there said, you know, there's a Tibetan, uh, monastery in Woodstock that, um, they're very, very nice. They have a practice this is, that is many ways similar to ours. And if you need a place to go for a little while to sort things out, I th they'll probably help you out. So I said, okay. And so I went over to the Tibetan monastery. It's, uh, Karma Triana Dharma Chakra, um, Karthar Kempo Rinpoche, and they took me in. And they let me um, work in exchange for lodging and train and, and learn with them. And I was there for about two weeks. And then I came back to New Hampshire and I called them and I set up the appointment. It was May. And I think we were in like January. And so a friend of mine said, look, you can come and stay with me. And get everything sorted out, do whatever you need to do. You're going to be leaving a couple months anyway, so just come in, come and live with me. I said, okay. So uh, he was living in Peterborough, and I moved to Peterborough, moved into his place, got a job working at a restaurant there. Uh, one of the ways that I made, uh, made my living as I was um, in, my, in my college years was uh, through service industry. So managing, uh, attending bar, waiting tables, and primarily at three, four, some five-star places. So I had a pretty good background um, in being able to bartend, wait tables, manage smaller restaurants. And so got a job in Peterborough running a restaurant, really great little place, and then took a month hiatus and, and went. But I was I was so drawn to the training and I was so certain and connected from that, um, both my time at Zen Mountain Monastery and at um, KTD, that I knew that I needed to do this. That no matter what, like I could make any other decision that I needed to afterwards, but I needed to go and try this and see if it would work. And I spent a lot of the time in between that, like three months or so, um, three or four months, um, sitting just practicing meditation and reading everything that I could on Zen and Buddhism in general, and really just loading myself up, prepping myself for the experience. Um, so that's, that's what I was doing during that time. When you look back on that now, you know, not, not just that time, but the meditative time, the, the, the Buddhism practice the zen practice um what pieces do you pull forward the most into your martial arts training and teaching mm. so the way that we train we have a um i think i'm gonna have to meander here a little bit to kind of lay out Please, the, the training methodology so we when when i was um for the last, you know, until I opened my school for that 10 year period from like 2001 to 2011, what I had a hard time with was that if I wanted to go train my campo, I went had to go to one school. If I wanted to train jujitsu, defensive tactics, I had to go to another school. If I wanted to train Brazilian jujitsu and do, do a little bit of MMA, I needed to go to another school. If I wanted to get some good reality-based self-defense training in, I needed to go, travel somewhere like San Diego or Virginia or Pennsylvania, New York City, and do a big seminar. And so I found myself traveling between all of these places all the time. And I, I had 
um, two young girls and was, you know, flying all over the country and trying to run several businesses and get the, this full training in and was um, at one point in time overlapping in that doing law school prep work. And so it, it was overwhelming. And I said to myself, I want, I wish there was a place where I could go and get all of this together that this was just the training modality, that this was the environment. And that, you know, you didn't have to go like, okay, well, you know, we're complete because we do Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you know, or we're complete because we do, oh, you know, self-defense or we're, you know, any of this kind of stuff. Um, And I love my teachers very, very much. And they encouraged me during that time where I was like, man, well, now I got to go here and I got to there. I got to juggle this because these guys are having a special guest. And so I can't come in here. And then I got to, it was just this juggling match. And in particular, uh, Sensei Rossi, uh, Lee Rossi, a, a checkmate encouraged me, um, introduced me to Terry and encouraged me as did Terry, um, later as well to, um, just do your, do my own thing. You know, they saw in me that I was, um, you know, that I had this vision of what I wanted the teaching and the martial arts to be like and the skill set of what I thought a really well-rounded practitioner should be like. And they were like, well, create it, make it, you know, if, if, if this is what you want to do, then do it, you know, and they encouraged me and supported me in doing that. And I'm always like very, very grateful um, for that. So when I started the gym, my goal was to bring all of these different training modalities, the striking, whether it's Savat or Muay Thai or Superfoot Systems or boxing, the um, grappling, you know, that's Judo or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or Nogi or Sambo or any of these, any of these things, wrestling, the, um, you know, the, the uh, takedowns, right, whether they're Judo based or Jiu Jitsu based or wrestling based, right, to bring all of that into the training environment so that all the students have a, a well-rounded base of knowledge. But where most of the MMA type gyms would then move towards um, cage tactics and you know timed rounds and things that are very specific to competing in a sport MMA environment. Um, I decided that that was not where I wanted to go. That rather than doing the MMA specific training, um, I wanted to round out my training environment and my practitioners with meditation. Um, a clear knowledge of the comparative history and philosophy of the arts, um, self-defense training, and um, you know the, the meditative aspects. And so our training modality is that you know we have striking, we have grappling, we have takedowns, we have self-defense, but we also have a principle-based teaching system that is academic. Um, we have a meditative practice that is. Um, a regular part of the training environment. And then we have a uh, history and philosophy component to that. And then an integrated arts component where each student is encouraged to create and build their own game. I like to tell my, my students that I'm going to give you a toolbox full of tools and what you build with that is entirely up to you. Like you might build a colonial assault box house and he might build a freaking race car. Like you, your games are going to be totally different. Um, and that's good. So the um, so that was the that was the vision, and so we go through phases in our rotating curriculum where we will bring the meditative practice in. We will have um, we always have at least one hour long period. Right now we have a ninety minute period that we do on Saturdays of seated meditation, and um, that's one of my favorite classes of the week. Saturday morning, and you just get an hour and a half of cultivated silence and mindfulness. Um, But we also bring the meditative practice in at the end of our training sessions and sometimes at the beginning too. So we'll do like a minute before class, we'll do five minutes or 10 minutes after class. And that is a really important thing because it allows you to clear away a lot of the noise and that useless information that we have floating in the, you know, on the surface of our consciousness and really let the, um, neural pathways that we've just ingrained in our training sink down deep into our subconscious so that we can open up our minds, get very, very clear and let what we've just done sink very, very deep. Um, So we use it in a lot of different ways, but I find it just, if nothing else, it helps people just be calm and it helps them to retain the substance of technique better. Mm. 
Now, I'm curious, as someone who owned a school, and I'm, I'm sure we have a number of school owners out there listening, the idea of bringing the meditative practice in, does that, thinking of how to ask this, is that a, a selective element? In other words, do people come in and the right folks stay? The ones that don't belong, you know, when they, when they see the meditative stuff, they, they kind of fade out or do you have ways of, of bringing that practice to everyone when let's be honest, they come in to train martial arts on day one, they're probably not expecting or, or seeking any kind of meditation. Sure. Um, well, a, we make it very clear that meditation is part of our, our training environment, part of our practice. We have certain classes where we don't do meditation, certain classes where we do. Um, the dedicated times people can come if they want to. Um, they don't have to if they if they don't. We um, the meditation that we do at the small periods before beginning, uh, uh, before and after certain classes is it's done as a mindfulness exercise and it's just taught as a means for training your mind to focus on the task at hand and what it is that you're going to do. Um, the people who are just coming into a uh, kickbox or do a fitness class or, uh, you know, something like that, a cardio kickboxing, they, they don't have to do any meditation and we don't really do meditation before or after those classes, but anybody who is ranking under me, um, or who trains in our self-defense based arts, um, has to. And many of the, um, and the, and that's just incorporated into the training environment. And we make it very clear. It's very clear on our website. It's very clear in the um, intake interview we do with, with clients that this is part of the part of the training environment. Um, I was very happy to see. I became a fast defense instructor a number of years ago, and Fast is a really good organization. And um, Bill Kip, Dick Chance, um, really really good people, and their their program is outstanding. The um, they incorporated a mindfulness element um, into their program. Um, and it's situated inside of the program where it's just a breathing exercise to get your adrenaline down because in that type of training, you get highly adrenalized and then you come down and then you go up and then you go down. You do that several times over the course of, of many hours. And that can, that's very stressful. You need a, a way for managing that, not just in the training, but should it happen in real life as well. And so they've put some meditative practices um, into their um, sort of open close and maintenance phases. And I was very happy to see that. So, I mean, I, th I think it's, it's one of those things where, um, I don't see how, I mean, I understand why many people don't incorporate it. I think primarily because most people don't have formal training in it. And it's a very difficult thing to understand without formal training. It would be like opening up a martial arts school, just having read books on the martial arts or maybe gone to like a weekend workshop and, um, and then trying to teach what you had learned. You know, meditation is not an abstract thinking process. It is training. And you have to address it as such. If you don't train, if you don't practice, you don't get better at it. It doesn't have any power to change your life. It doesn't do anything um, transformative. You know, you have to practice. And it's very counterintuitive to many people, particularly us Westerners, because we're very up in our heads, that you can be sitting there literally doing nothing, right? Trying to calm your mind and find a moment of true silence beyond the chatter. And you feel like you're not doing anything because we're conditioned in our lives to be like, Oh, you're sitting there doing nothing. Well, what are you doing to be productive? Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you doing something, something else? Why, you know? Um, and so there's a lot of trepidation and a lot of misunderstanding about what it actually is to put your butt on the cushion and do the meditative work. Um, but the, the people who come to us and who, um, uh, stay and engage the process. One of the reasons why they do it is because we offer something that very, very, um, few places do. And I think that many, many people, particularly practitioners of the traditional martial arts, um, appreciate and understand the meditative, the value of, of having a meditative practice and how having a meditative practice in your practice is very much in accord and in line with the Budo and with karate and with, with the spirit of the, of the Japanese martial arts, especially the connection to Zen, which is very, very deep. 
Um, they just don't have any formal training in it, so they don't know how to teach it. They don't know how to incorporate it very well. That was kind of where where I was thinking, based on my experience in, in training, and you know, I certainly see the value. But you know, again, a lot of people aren't going to know what they're in for when they come in, and, and it sure. sounds like you've handled it in a, a really beneficial way you know helping them without them even realizing it you know we're gonna we're gonna feed you this good stuff whether you you came for it or not and i think sure that's great. well and we also just to kind of put a caveat on that before you ask your next question um we don't attach any religious symbolism to it so we just teach the meditative techniques as a means for accessing discipline focus concentration within the context of the martial arts and the training environment there. We don't, we're not teaching anything Zen. We're not a, you know, I'm not a Zen teacher or, or anything like that. Zen is my background, but there's nothing religious about how we teach it. We teach it as a, a technique of training the mind as part of our martial practice. That's an important distinction. And, and I'm glad you, you brought that up. Certainly. And I, I think anytime you get into something like meditation for folks that are un inexperienced, they may very well draw some connections between that practice and something faith based. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many meditative traditions very, very deep in the in the Christian traditions as well. Um, I spent some time with some Quaker communities when I lived in, in Pennsylvania, and they have a very deep meditative practice inside of their um, inside of their community, inside of their their um, belief system, um, the uh, Catholic monks, um, uh, Jesuit priests, like it, it, there is a long tradition of Christian mysticism um, that is, you know, it it all lives in that meditative wisdom tradition family of practice. Um, so, you know, it's, I think meditation is something that transcends religious boundaries, just like martial arts is. Hmm. Totally. That that was a lot of origin story, and and you, you kind of warned us in a sense, uh, not not that there was anything negative about it, but just that we were going to take a meandering path, and and absolutely, I don't know that we could have gotten to who you are now and and where your approach to martial arts comes from without having taken us on that journey. So I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you being so open about it. But I'd like to switch gears and start plugging in some of the other elements that you've given us the foundation for. Through all those travels, I mean, you, you, you told us some stories. But if someone was to call you up on stage and in front of a large audience and say, hey, you know, you've been doing martial arts a long time. I know you've got a lot of stories. What's your best martial arts story? Okay. Um that's a really good one. And I'm going to tell you a story, but it's going to be a little bit different than I think maybe what you're expecting. Um, do you know who Dave Lowry is? Only a name. Okay. So Dave Lowry is, um, is one of the, um, I think great literary voices in the American martial arts world. Uh, I grew up reading his stuff. He wrote for black belt magazine for a very long time. He's written a number of books and he is a very, very deep um, Budo practitioner. He's very, very steeped in the traditional warrior arts of, of Japan. And he, he wrote a book called Moving Towards Stillness, which is just a very short um, – it, it's a series of short essays. And they're brilliant. But there's one in there that um, I, I retell to my students all of the time. And it has so much meaning to me and I think um, is so universal that it, it can really have meaning for, for everyone. It's called When the Hototogisu Won't Sing or When the Nightingale Won't Sing. Um, and the, the story basically goes that there is an old piece of Japanese folklore called When the Hototogisu Won't Sing. A Hototogisu is a Japanese nightingale. It has a very, very beautiful song, but it can also be temperamental when kept in captivity. And so... The um, old piece of Japanese folk dog rule uh, asks the question, what will you do when the Hotogisu won't sing? And uh, 
the rest of the poem answers the question from the viewpoint of three of the um, most formidable political figures in Japanese uh, political history through the Sengoku period leading up to um, Tokugawa Ayasu, uh, who founded the um, Tokugawa Shogunate that lasted 300 years until the Meiji Restoration. Um, and the first answer to that, what we do in The Nightingale Won't Sing, is given by Oda Nobunaga. And uh, Oda Nobunaga was a general who overthrew the existing shogun um, and became ruler of all Japan. He was a ruthless dictator. He was um, He accomplished everything that he did through just brute force and intimidation. And his answer to that is what we do in the, the Nightingale Won't Sing, kill it. And that very much summed up the, the, his ruling philosophy and his personality. Um, when he died, there was a succession issue and the person who ended up becoming the ruler of all Japan after him was uh, uh, Hideyoshi Toyotomi. And uh, he was also a... You know, brilliant military tactician and a ruthless dictator, but he was much more skilled in statecraft. He was able to bribe and bring a, lo a lot of people onto his side through the use of money, coercion, um, uh, marriages for members of his family and political alliances. And so when he was asked the question, what will you do when the nightingale won't sing? His answer was, try to make it. And that very much summed up his political philosophy and how he ruled. The next person in that succession of history is uh, uh, Ayase Tokugawa. And he was an absolutely brilliant statesman and politician. He was a um, very, very deep thinker. And he was someone who drew allegiance to him through um, love through loyalty, through participation, through the fair treatment of others. He was um, very, very skilled at statecraft and really brought the Sengoku period to an end and unified all of Japan under his shogunate. And when he was asked this question, what we do in the Hotogisu won't sing, um, he answers, wait. So you have three answers to that. What we do in the Nightingale won't sing. Kill it, try to make it, or wait. And what Lowry takes away from that story in the context of the article that is in his book is he says that there are three different types of students that will walk through your door and come into training. And you can classify each one of them by whether they're a, um, you know, they're an Oda Nobunaga or a Toyotomi or a, a Tokugawa. And I find that to be true to a certain extent, but um, more so, I like to think of it as each one of us as a student, anybody who comes to training, is going to go through periods and phases of their training or moments of their training where they are being a Nobunaga or they are being a um, Toyotomi or whether they're being a, uh, a, a Tokugawa. You think about how what we do when we first come to training, we, you know, a barrier is put up or a task is set to us and we tense up, we get really muscly and then we try to uh, just plow through it. You know, you think about people when they just start sparring, everything is hard and you just got to kill it. You got to smash it down. Right. Um, after a certain amount of time, you realize that like, that's just not efficient and you don't progress very effectively that way, that that's not the answer to everything. That to be stiff, to be rigid, to be putting up walls, be trying to smash everything is not going to work. And then you cross over into a phase where you go, well, maybe if I can't force it, if I can't make it, you know, then maybe I can get it to do what I, you know, what I want it to do. Maybe I can make it in a way that is a little more subtle, that doesn't involve that direct application of brute force. And after a while, you go, oh, you know, this is working much better. Like this, this is good. You can be soft, you can be flexible, you still have the ability to access those parts of the, the training that are hard and that are rigid, but when you need them and you can still be um, pliable. Um, then you cross over into a point of training 
where you realize that no matter how hard or soft or flexible or pliable you get, um, there is nothing that affects us so much or that is so important to the development of our practice as just time and mat time, time spent training and practicing. And the difference between you know a, a three-year black belt and a 10-year black belt is time. It's mat time, it's training, it's, it's, um, you know, it's that time. And so at a certain point in time, you say, okay, I, I just have to wait. I have to trust the process and just continue and not be thinking about and obsessing on or trying to control and manipulate all the time where things are, what they're going to do, but just allowing the subconscious intuitive mind to pick up the process and manifest itself. Um, and that, that can be tricky because wait does not imply or mean just waiting. Just waiting is just waiting. Like there's no action. There's no movement. There's no um, aliveness because it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to come do my thing. All right, well, I'm waiting, you know. Um, wait implies a, a, a heaviness, a, a pregnancy with, with work, with dedication, with – um, with practice, with laying the foundations, with planting seeds, going back to Tokugawa, um, who talked often about, you know, planting the seed of a relationship with somebody, knowing that it's not going to come into full bloom until 20 years later, 30 years later, later, maybe not even in his lifetime, but having the view that far out. Um, and so I love that story because inevitably in any martial art, people get frustrated they kind of, they plateau, they end up finding places where like, oh, I don't feel like I'm getting better. I don't know what's happening. I don't, and this is a good time when I whip out this story and I tell it. And usually I'll give it a little spin relating to something that somebody is experiencing inside of the dojo. But looking at what our minds are doing, you and I were training just the other, last week, Jeremy, right? And yeah. you and I as very experienced people, right? We went through all of these periods inside of our two hour private class with Terry, where yeah. we're trying something new. We want to smash it. It's not going to happen. Okay. We get a little, okay, that's a little better. All right. Well, now what are you going to do? Okay. We just got to go home and keep practicing it and, and wait, you know, for it to develop and, and really take root, you know? So we go through all three of those mindsets and those mind states right there. Um, and that happens in meditation. It happens in the martial arts. It happens in our lives with things that we want to force that aren't ready. Um, but that is probably my favorite martial arts story. And it's kind of weird coming from me because I am not a traditional classicist. Um, and, you know, for somebody with a very modern approach and skill set like I do to be talking Dave Lowry and uh, Sengoku period of Japan, is, it may seem a little off, but it's a, it's a wonderful story and it's really universal. And I think um, many people can take value from that regardless of what their um, basis for their training is. Mm. That's a great story. There's a tremendous lesson in there and, and listeners, I hope. I hope you'll you'll put a pin in this one because that's a story that I think we all need to hear from time to time, just as you said, Sensei, that you share it in the dojo from time to time. We all need to hear that, you know, and I, and I think the longer that we spend training, the more prone we are to want to take that first or second approach, kill it or, or make it. I'm either going to stop training this thing that's hard and, focus on something else and tell myself, you know, well, my time is better spent over here. Maybe it is, or I'm going to make it. I'm in, you know, if an hour a week, two hours a week working on it, isn't enough, I'm going to put in 12 hours a week. You know, it's, I'm going to dedicate all of my time to it. And, you know, sometimes that's the exact opposite of what you need. Uh, that's true. Um, and you think about, just think about how, um, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in particular, but you, you know, new people are very, they're very tense and they can't put any move on at less than 90% intensity, you know? And that's that sense of like, gotta kill it, gotta kill it, gotta smash it, you know, gotta, um, gotta make that happen, you know? And we all end up there in one way or another. Um, you know, at some point in time, it's just how mindful are we of it and what do we do to take steps to, you know, bring our awareness to it, our mindfulness to it and change it, you know? Sure. You've talked a bit about the, really the, the wide array of schools and instructors that you've had, and certainly your, your 
you are a diverse martial artist, a renaissance man of combat, if you will. But I'm sure that there are others out there that you would want to train with. So we ask this question in a pretty open way. If you could train with anyone from any point in time that you haven't, who would you want to train with? Oh, that is a really good question. I'm I'm so fortunate because I've trained with just amazing people. And um oh man, somebody that you know, it's it's interesting for me in the interest of like really pushing my if it were to be a historical like person, like I think um Dan Inosanto. I mean, really like there is if somebody said, okay, you got to pick right now, where would you go? What would you do? Um, I would want to go to the Inosanto Academy and and train with him, train train there. Um, there are so many other people that are on that list. I would love to train with Doug Mercada, with Burton Richardson, but really like, um, you know, if there's one person, yeah, I would love to just have a couple hours with Dan Inosanto. Good choice. You get a lot of stuff out, oh, of, out of that one pick, don't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the whole point is you want to talk about somebody who can draw from this very diverse background and then teach from a comparative approach and incorporate all of these ties that bind all of the fluid elements and the principles of the arts together. Like he, he was doing that before nobody else was doing that. And he's still just the master, you know, mm. Has competition ever been part of your training? It, it has. Okay. Um, so my thing was, um, you know, I realized very, very early on, particularly like during my wrestling days, that physical strength and athleticism was never my strong suit. Um, I'm not an athletic guy. I'm prone to injury. I've got some congenital stuff that you know makes it makes it difficult. So I'm not the most physically talented. I was always the guy who had to train twice as hard as everybody to be like in the middle of the pack. But I realized that my strength lay more in my brain, that I had a pretty decent head on my shoulders just in terms of my intellectual capacity. And so um, my – I'm sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> Competition. Competition. That's right. Um, and so – my path didn't really go towards competition as much because I spent a lot of time dealing with real world violence, both at the social and at the asocial um, end of the spectrum. And so when it came to sporting violence, like I'm a very non-aggressive person. I don't want to be engaged in any sort of physical altercation. And then when I am, I want to do the minimum amount of force or damage necessary to facilitate my ability to escape, to get out, to disengage, to get away from the situation. That's just my personality. And I think that my exposure to violence earlier on in my life really made me violence averse in a lot of ways. But um, I have competed a few times. There was, uh, you know, the, when I was wrestling uh, in high school and during the camps, um, I've I've done some in-house Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournaments. I've done uh, the main skirmish up with uh, with with uh, Mike Heward's event up in Maine. Um, I went out. I went to uh, California and did the. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Florida, and did the uh, Jiu-Jitsu America Sport Jiu-Jitsu Competition National Championships, and I won my class in that. Uh, that was in 2010. Um, you know, there was some minor sport kickboxing, some smokers and stuff like that. But, um, you know, competition was never my motivation, although we do train in a lot of sport based arts. So all of my students have a kickboxing game, have a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu game, can spar MMA style. Um, it was never really by the time I really got dedicated into training and was in really, really immersed in it. Um, full-time MMA was taking off and I had too many injuries. I have a artificial disc in my neck. So I have a titanium and polyethylene articulating disc in my neck, I had two knee surgeries, a shoulder reconstruction. Um, you know, I've got a high rheumatoid factor. So my body's just chewing away all of my connective tissue anyway. So I kind of hit a point where it was impractical and just not worth the returns for me to compete anymore. So my competition experience has been very light, although I have done some. Are you at all a fan of movies, of martial arts movies? I am. I had a feeling. 
Do you have any favorites? <laughs> um, I do. I tend to like the, um, I tend to like the really, not the classic ones, uh, or any of the mainstream, um, you know, I was not a Power Rangers guy. I was not really a big Bruce Lee fan or any of that stuff. Um, what really gets it for me is the real gritty, um, uh, you know, hardcore down to earth stuff. So I, uh, man from nowhere, um, the born series did some, some pretty good, um, uh, martial arts. Uh, there was, a, there were a lot of underground films through like Japan and, uh, and China back in the nineties, a lot of which I can't, I can't remember the name of, but, um, you're seeing a lot of movies come out of Korea. Now you've got old boy. Um, you know, I like the, I like a lot of the arts that are, that, um, martial arts movie that involve Filipino martial arts, a lot of very close quarters fighting, really well choreographed, like knife and stick work, um, you know, that sort of stuff rather than the ranged sort of sport fighting, sparring based martial arts movies. Um, so I like the sort of down and dirty combatives type movie rather than um, the stylistic Kung Fu Karate movie, but that's just my preference. Hmm. Are there any actors that you're, you're, prone to watch more than others? Not really. I just look for good films. Um, I'm at a point in time in my life with the kids and the wife and the gym and the, all of the, the rest of it, um, the writing, I'm in the process of writing a book. So we don't get much time to watch movies. Um, occasionally I'll get a period where, you know, I've got an hour and I'm like, Oh, and I'll just kind of throw something on real quick. But a lot of times I end up just truncating it for time. Um, I just don't have time to really watch TV. And a lot of times when I do, um, you know, I have like half an hour, I'll be with my wife and we'll turn on something funny at the end of the night to decompress. I don't want to watch a hardcore fight scene. So I'm, I'm afraid my movie martial arts knowledge is, is probably a little behind the times and a little obscure. So <laughs> that is okay. No judgment. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Your, your passion for martial arts entertainment, uh, is, is not fundamental to your skill or rank, fortunately. Although I'm sure there are a lot of folks in this world that, um, that seem to think otherwise that their, mm. their time in watching Bruce Lee gives them some credibility. Well, when I, I think of like watching martial arts movies, actually, I think the most interesting martial arts watching experience that I've ever had is when we were promoting Global Fight League. Um, I was cage side doing as commentator, basically doing Joe Rogan's job. Um, for that organization for 10, 11, 11 events. So I, I enjoyed that and took so much more out of that um, than any martial arts movie that I've, I've ever seen. I mean, being able to sit cage side and announce um, or, or rather commentate with, uh, with a, another person there right there. And a lot of the guys you're watching um, in the cage or fighting are your, your friends, are your um, teachers, your training partners or coaches or your, um, um, you know, training partners, you know, it's really, you know, that, that to me is like, that's martial arts entertainment for me right there, probably to the, to the extreme. Mm. Mm. There, there's, there's something, you know, as, as with any contest that, that, difference between being there live versus watching it on TV. There's just no comparison. Yeah. It was funny. I, cause a lot of the guys knew that I trained cause I, you know, I, I, it's a small world. Um, it was sometimes a habit that some of the guys, when they were on the ground, if they were over towards the side of the cage where they knew that I was commentating, they would drag the guy over so that they could be by the commentator's table to listen to the commentary to help get, um, you know, to, to hear what our take is on what the, they should do. Um, I had that happen a couple of times where I'm sitting there and I'm going like, you know, I don't want to be giving the guy coaching because I know he's right here. He's six inches away from me and I know he can hear what I'm saying, but I've got to call it the way that I see it too, you know? So my partner is going like, what do you think you should do here? And I'm like, well, I think you should posture up and control the hips so that he can get some, and then he starts doing it and you're like, oh, okay, like, I, you know, uh, that, that was, that was a fun thing, you know? That's and, true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, uh, you were kind of the X factor for anybody that knew what was going on there. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> You've mentioned a few books during our time today. And for the listeners out there, are there any that you might recommend to them? Sure. Um, I, gosh, I, I love to read and I read from a, a wide array of sources. So 
if you're interested in traditional martial arts in uh, the Japanese martial arts in really Do and Budo, um, I would say get Dave Lowry's books. He wrote a great book called In the Dojo, which is your basic guide to terminology of all of the things in the traditional Japanese dojo and why they're called what they're called, how they're supposed to function. Um, Moving Towards Stillness, which is a collection of of essays. Um, he has two other books that I don't have right here with me. That the name is just slipping from me right now. But anything written by Dave Lowry as far as the traditional uh, martial arts is just wonderful from the philosophical academic side. You're not going to get um, technique. You're going to get stories. Um, anything in by Rory Miller. Um, so Meditations on Violence, Facing Violence, Scaling Force. Um, any of his books are outstanding. He's one of my teachers. He comes and does a weekend workshop with us once a year. Um, amazing guy, one of the best in the business. So I, I can't recommend his books highly enough. And those are in the sort of reality-based martial arts um, family. Um, and then I actually took your advice and I'm reading uh, A Killing Art mm-hmm. right now. So I just uh, just got it and opened it the other night. And so um, you know that's what's on my that's what's on my bedside right now, along with some other stuff. But um, also, if you're looking to get a, and this is something that I find is really important, particularly for people who have less diverse backgrounds, is um, there are a number of books uh, written by Krauss and Cordoza that are a series of different, they've got one on like Muay Thai, they've got one like Anderson Silva, they've got one on um, Theodore Machida, they've got one on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, they did one with Marcelo Garcia, they, you know, Salo Ribeiro, Jiu Jitsu University. Um, you can go and pick up those books and what those books are, are a nice overview of the philosophy of the individual and the teacher, and then a step-by-step guide of families of techniques. So if you're an advanced practitioner and you have a little bit less diverse a background, and you would really like to get a survey course in what some of the other modern martial arts or combatives arts are out there, the Krauss and Cordoza series is excellent because you can get a very in-depth view with some really good technique that you can look at and train and incorporate into your training environment. Um, and they're, they're very quality. They're very well done. So I guess three different families of selections of books from three different fields. And I'll drop those names over on the show notes, whistlekick, com for anybody that might be new to the show. That's where we put the show notes for everything. Awesome. What's keeping you going? I know you've got goals. You, you mentioned you're, you're working on a book and you're running a school and you're training yourself, but there's got to be a why in there. So I'm curious of that. Yeah. Um, martial arts changed my life and meditative practice changed my life. And I spent a good portion of my life very lost and doing a lot of damaging and destructive things to myself and to other people around me. And really, I think it was just through blind luck and the love and support of my family that I am here in the way that I am right now rather than in prison or dead. And I see what martial arts does for people. I I know what it is that I wish I had when I was struggling and I want to provide that to other people. Um, I want to help people. I want to see the martial arts do for them what it has done for me because I feel like I have a lot to give back because I, I owe a lot to many, many, many people. And um, when I – the point that I got involved with GFL, I was just about to go to law school and I was looking at law school because I wanted to do constitutional law and civil rights work and um, – do pro bono and um, really help people who were caught up in a legal system that they didn't know how to deal with and that they couldn't afford or pay pay for to navigate. And very quickly into my um, my first year of um, of graduate training, I basically saw the reality of what sitting at a desk eight hours a day and constantly arguing with people was, and the fact that. Um, Everybody that I spoke to and all of my mentors and all the people that I met and that I was um, studying under were all miserable and they kept saying the same thing to me, which was make sure you have an out. And I'm going, man, this is not a good <laughs> – this is not something good to hear from the people who are in the field that you're planning on going into. 
And so I said, you know, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, this is, I don't think that I can do that. I don't think that that's my path. And I think that it's going to be the hours, the time, the stress, it's going to be very, very difficult and hard on the family. And so we were like, well, but what are we going to do? And and my whole directive was, I need to do something that does good. I need to live a soulful life. I need to do something with meaning that is helping people and that is giving back. And at that point, the just natural thing was martial arts, open up a school. And so what keeps me going is the fact that I'm not done. I have work to do. Um, there's a lot of people out there who need help. I need help. I need to keep doing this so that I can be um, a good person and, a, and a, a mindful individual and create as little suffering in my actions for other people as I can. Um, so that's, that's what drives me. Good stuff. If anybody listening wants to pop in a visit, train with you, contact you, you know, for any reason, how might they do those things? So we're on the web at prevailmartialarts.com. You can reach me at uh, prevailmartialarts at gmail.com. We have um, a beautiful training facility. Our schedule is linkable on the schedule tab on our webpage. We do ask that anybody who comes in um, uh, schedules an appointment first. We don't take walk-ins. And uh, we do that for a couple of different reasons. A, because we have a very, very good community of people who um, we're not a fighter's gym. We're not a competition-based gym. And we need to make sure that anybody who would walk in the door is going to be a stable, okay person. Um, because we won't just let anyone onto our mat. So if you want to come train with us, we have people from other gyms pop in all the time. We are always welcome to people who want to come in. All we ask is that you call or email and set up an appointment first. Cool. As we wind up here, what last bits would you leave the listeners with? Some some advice, if you would. Um. I think that every person has something in their heart very, very deep that they know is true, but that they're afraid of expressing. And for whatever reason, that fear then goes on to control us and control our lives. And so if there's one thing I can leave anybody with, it's identify that thing. Um, study that thing. What is that thing that you know to be true, that you love but that you fear and examine it, investigate it, investigate it through your martial arts, investigate it through your parenting skills, investigate it through your job, investigate it through everything that you do in your life. Because the sooner you come to grips with that, the more happier and the, the happier and more fulfilled you're going to be. And the martial arts can be an incredible tool, an incredible vehicle for doing that. I enjoy speaking with all of our guests, but Sensei Hubbard is someone I'm pleased to say has become a friend. I expect he'll be back on this show sometime, and I hope to make it back to his dojo to train very soon. Thank you, Sensei Hubbard, for coming on today. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find those show notes with photos, links, websites, social media, and a whole bunch more. You can find us on social media. We're everywhere, including the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Please, if you haven't, check out martialartscalendar.com. We made it a really easy domain, and you know exactly what it does. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>